Yo people, what's up? Welcome to another Magic the Gathering Commander video! And today we're gonna look at Vorel's Experiment, a blue-green deck. Which is kind of interesting because it puts my most favorite color together with the one I said last time was my least favorite color. So, blue and green, which is nice. Um, let's look at this interesting deck and see what it does. First, our general is Vorel of the Hull Clade. Um, a very simple but effective creature. For one green and a blue, you're getting a legendary human merfolk, 1-4, which has the ability to pay a green and a blue, tap it, and then double the number of each kind of counter on target artifact, creature, or land. So that means if a creature, for example, has a charge counter and a 1 plus 1 plus 1 counter, uh, you activate this ability and target that creature, and now it has two charge counters and two 1-1 one -one counters. And next time you do it, four of each kind, and then eight, and so forth. So, yes, this is kind of a counter deck. A 1-1 one -one and charge counter deck and all the good stuff. So let's uh, look through our creatures and see what kind of goodies we have. We have first the Acidic Slime, a very uh, good green creature, Death Touch, and if it enters the battlefield, destroy the artifact, enchantment, or land. Very simple card, but it's played in a lot of green EDH commander decks. Next up we have Altered Ego, which is basically a clone with upside. So you pay X, 2, green and blue. It cannot be countered, which is, in my opinion, a huge upside, because that means whatever you copy, it comes into play, it um, gets its entered the battlefield effect. So that's very nice. Um, and then the other upside is you ha may have Alter Ego, well, you enter it as a copy of an, any creature onto the battlefield, except it enters with X additional 1-1 one, one counters on it. So you can even play this for just two green-blue for an uncounterable clone, but you can also put some more counters on it, which is nice. Bane of Progress, I just recently got a hold of this because I didn't have it beforehand. Um, basically, when it enters the battlefield, destroy all artifacts and enchantments, and you put 1-1 one, one counters onto Bane of Progress for each permanent destroyed this way. So, if your opponents play a lot of artifacts, which is actually normal in EDH, you get a huge elemental, which is absolutely great. Buy a visionary! One green, blue, at the beginning of your end step, if you control four or more creatures named Buy a visionary, you win the game. You may know me, um, I love alternative win conditions, and this is one of them. Um, of course, some of you might say, why are you playing this? You can only play one Biovisionary in your deck. Yes, but I can play 20 clones in my deck. <laughs> Different kind of clones, obviously. But it's actually very easy to get four of these. We'll, we'll discover that later on. Next up, Bird of Paradise. A very classic card for some mana fixing. The Coiling Oracle. If you play it, you reveal your top card of your library. If it's a land, you put it onto the battlefield, otherwise it's in your hand. So it's just upside, and if you can get it somehow on your hand again, or uh, something like that, it gets multiple benefits, which is nice. Next up, the Cold-Eyed Selkie, which looks like the girl from the ring, for some reason. Uh, she has Island Walk which in some decks it, this comes into play, but her main ability is whenever Cold Eyes Selkie deals combat damage to a player, you may draw that many cards. So you want to pump this one, uh, put 1-1 one, one counters on it, double these counters if possible, and just make it a huge menace and get a lot of card draw from it. Speaking of card draw, Eldrig the Spymaster of Trest is one of the coolest political cards in this deck. Um, whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may draw a card. So this incentivizes your opponents to attack each other for benefits, which is kind of nice. If they attack you, they don't get any cards. It needs to be an opponent of you. So they, you basically say, go attack each other, get more cards this way, and leave me alone, which is nice. Phantom Mage, uh, two green blue for a one one. It has Evolve, and which means Evolve means whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, 
if it has greater power or toughness than this creature, um, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on this creature. So it doesn't matter if it's greater toughness or if it's greater power. If one of those is true, you get a plus one plus one counter on it. And of course, whenever Phantom Mage gets a one, a plus one plus one counter on it, you draw a card. So you get a stronger creature and draw cards. Forgotten Agent, whenever a player casts a spell, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Forgotten Agent, and then at the beginning of your upkeep you may shift any number of 1-1 one, one counters from Forgotten Agent onto other creatures. So that's, for example, is one way to get more counters onto Coldite Selkie, because in itself Coldite Selkie cannot get any counters, but yeah. Um, next up, the Genesis Hydra, which is basically a Genesis wave, or like a neutered Genesis wave um, in form of a creature. So you cast it um, with X, and that's the important thing. It says when you cast Genesis Hydra, so you cannot get countered, it cannot get rid of in any kind of way. Um, you may put a non-land permanent card with common mana cost X or less from among them onto the battlefield. Uh, of course, you um, reveal the top X cards as well. So, it's not quite Genesis Wave, but it's Genesis Wave attached to a creature, so I expect it to be a little, little worse than a Genesis Wave, but it's still awesome. And of course the Hydra enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters, as you know Hydras do. Gigantoplasm, again clone with upside for three and a blue, and this time the clone has the ab ability to pay X and then the creature has base power and toughness XX, so you can make something ridiculously huge. Again, called Eid Selkie, copy it and then put 10 mana into it and just draw 10 cards, because it's funny. Uh, Gilder Bairn is a very interesting card. It's one of the cards of the few that have the untap symbol. You will not see this today anymore. I'm pretty sure um, Wizards said at one point they will never ever do untap symbols again because untap symbols have been the source of some of the most ridiculous infinite combos ever. And I think Gilded Baron can be used for some of them. But I don't, so it's okay. Uh, basically this one says two and green or blue and then untap and then for each counter on target permanent put another of those counters onto that permanent. So it just gives you one more. It's kind of nice because you can do that in combat. You can attack with, for example, Gilder Bra Bairn and another creature with counters. And then in response to the blocks, untap the Gilder Bairn and pump your other creature. So you have some nice uh, opportunities with this card. Gyre Sage is a mana elf that gives you green mana for the amount of 1-1 counters on it. And it also has Evolve, so the more big creatures you pump out with it, the stronger it gets, which is nice. Yugon, the Rising Star, one of the um, five dragons from Kimigawa. The green one, of course, is when it dies, you may distribute five 1-1 one -one counters among any number of target creatures. Next up, the Kurifex, God of Horizons, one of the Therios gods, and of course he shares some similarities. He's indestructible, and as long as your devotion to green and blue is less than seven, Kurifex isn't a creature, so it's hard to interact with this one. And his main ability, that's why I play him, if unused mana would empty from your mana pool, which is at the end of your turn, at the end of every phase, I think, then that mana becomes colorless instead. So you keep it, but it becomes colorless. But that changes your playstyle tremendously. Of course, sometimes you'll just wait with your mana open, and then at the end of somebody's turn you want to play something, or counter. And of course that always runs with the risk that you will not be able to actually counter something, and then you lost your mana. Now you can just spend the mana at the end of your opponent's turn, and then get some colorless mana for your next main phase, which is kind of amazing. Here we have next up the Lifeblood Hydra, one Hydra more, and as all Hydras, you pay all, almost all Hydras, I think. You pay X and then three green, it has trample and it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. If it dies, you gain life and draw cards equal to its power. 
So you can um, pretty much with uh, Vorel, you can pump this thing up to a ridiculous amount, and if it ever dies, you, well, you have to be careful, of course. Don't make it too big or you draw yourself to death. And because you have to draw the cards. So, be a bit careful, but this can be like a life insurance for you. The lore scale Quattle, that's how you say it, right? Quattle is uh, a little snake, and whenever you draw a card, you may put a 1 1 counter on it. So, because this deck has a lot of card draw, this thing will grow immensely quick. And it should not be target of many removal spells, because in itself, it's not a very, very big target. But it can become something immensely uh, annoying very quickly. Next up, we have another Hydra, the Mana Gorcher Hydra this time. Whenever a player casts a spell, you put a 1-1 one -one counter on it. It's small, it's a 1-1 one -one for 3 with Trample, but in a heated game where it's not getting targeted very fast, it can grow to an immense amount. So, people have to watch out for this one. Here we have the Biomancer, no, the Master Biomancer. And if he's on the battlefield, each of your creatures enters the battlefield with a number of one additional 1-1 one -one counters on it, equal to Master Biomancer's power. And it's also a mutant, which is kind of cool, right? You get all these mutant uh, creatures on... You're like the X-Men or something. It's the X-Men deck if you play him, which is cool, really. Um, basically, what you want to do with this one is either put a lot of 1-1 one -one counters on the Master Biomancer himself, or, for example, Alter Ego your Master Biomancer with a lot of counters on it, or something like that. Or have multiple Master Biomancers, of course. And then it gets ridiculous quite quickly, and it will require a board wipe very soon. Here we have the Merc Fiend Leech, which is the one of the leeches from... Ooh, what was this set called? Shadow Moor? Something like that. Uh, basically, there's one of each color pairing, I guess. Of one of each uh, double color. And it basically gives plus one, plus one to uh, green creatures, plus one, plus one to blue creatures. Of course, if they're both, they're getting plus two, plus two. And you can untap all green or blue creatures you control during each other player's untap step. I know there's a lot of creatures that have been banned from EDH. But this one is not, because it I guess it's only restricted to green and or blue creatures. So I guess that's why, because it's not in cannot go in every deck. But still, there's a lot of cards that have been banned for exactly the same reason. Or almost, I think. Here we have the Nimbus Swimmer, which is a X green blue creature. So it's as big as you want it to play. If you play it early, it's going to be small. If you play it late, it's going to be big. And it's basically a flyer. And you just put X11 counters on it. It's... Uh, the thing is, uh, what I saw in most EDH is people don't have a lot of things to deal with flyers. I often find. So something as simple as this can be very, very difficult to deal with. The Pelaka Worm is uh, one of my favorite creatures, seriously. It's so good. It's a 7-7 Trample. If it enters the battlefield, you gain life. If it dies, you draw cards. It's everything you want, right? Next up, we have a Frog. Not just a Frog. It's a Frog Mutant. It's the Flaxcaster Frogling. And it has Graft. Graft 3, in fact. Graft, of course, is... Um, it enters the battlefield with three 1-1 one, one counters on it, and whenever another creature of yours enters the battlefield, you may have a 1-1 one, one counter from this creature put onto the creature that was just put into play. So you get to shift some counters around from Flaxcaster Frogling. And then, the other ability, for two you can uh, gift target creature with 1-1 one, one counter on it, Shroud until end of turn. So this can be very good against spot removal. So you can protect your creatures as long as you have two mana up. If you have more, you can protect more creatures at the same time. But often enough, two mana open and this out means your creatures will not get targeted by spot removal. Next up, uh, one of the more famous blue green cards, I think, Prime Speaker Zegana. Uh, very simple. She enters the battlefield with X11 counters where X is the greatest powers among creatures you control. 
So, uh, if you have some mildly big creatures out, this is gonna be insane. Because if she enters the battlefield, you draw cards equal to it, her power. So, yeah. Uh, prepare it right, and you'll get a massive card draw. Here we have the Primordial Hydra, another Hydra with X. This one, of course, again, enters the battlefield with X11 counters on it. And the beginning of your upkeep, double the amount of 1-1 counters on Primordial Hydra. If it has if it has 10 or more 1-1 uh, counters, it has also Trample. This is a must remove. It just simply is. Because with Vorel out on the battlefield, you quadruple your counters every turn. So, let's just do some innocent math here. Let's say you have 5 mana, you enter this into the battlefield with 3. Next turn, it's gonna be 12. The turn after that, it's gonna be uh, 48. Yeah, okay, you're dead. So, yeah, people need to remove this, otherwise they just die to it. Here is one of, I think, the most favorite card in this deck of mine. Progenitor Mimic. Again, a clone with upside. You may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature onto the battlefield, except it gains. At the beginning of your upkeep, if this creature isn't a token, create a token that's a copy of this creature. I know that sounds a bit cryptic, but basically that means your original progenitor mimic will each turn create a copy of itself. And of course it would be ridiculous if these copies then would themselves create more copies, that's why it's written this way. So basically whatever you enter it the battlefield as, it will get another copy of that every turn. So if it does not get killed, you will swarm people. Also, Progenitor Mimic, Biomancer, win. <laughs> uh, was it Biomancer or Biovisioner? I'm not quite sure which one it was. You know which one I mean. Next up, the Simic Manipulator. Um, it's 0-1 with a wolf for 3. What the hell is this about? Well, as soon as it has some amount of 1-1 counters, you can do the following. You can tap and remove one or more 1-1 counters from Simic Manipulator. Then you gain control of target creature with power less than or equal to the number of 1-1 counters who move this way. So you get to steal stuff with it, which is awesome. Simic Sky Swallower, as dumb as this creature looks, it's, it's just kinda good. It's just this very simple combination of flying, trample and shroud, and that makes it incredibly hard to deal with. They cannot target it with uh, single target removal, Blocking it is very hard because it has flying and it just trump blocking it with like um, Top their tokens is not enough because it has trample It's because it's so hard to interact with and it comes with that specific set of skills It's uh, it's kind of a nuisance and I've actually won a few games with this card alone And the thing is you cannot even copy it because it has shroud and not hexproof, but still it's just on its own, it's just very good for some reason. The Vigian Graft Mage is next. It has of course Graft 2. And you can on top target creature with a 1-1 counter on it for 1 and a blue. Which is cool, because you can do it on yourself. You can do it, of course, on any other creatures, because in this deck you can get counters on pretty much anything but the Simic Sky Swallower. Well, I think there's some way to get uh, counters on it anyway. The Vorel of the Hulk Clade, we already looked at that, of course. Next up, the Wing Quattle, the second Quattle, and actually I like this one a lot more. It's one green blue for a flash flying death touch. It's a 1 1, but it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Seriously, flash flying death touch is, is, is like amazing. It's the best thing. You can kill things with it you would never dream of. As soon as you see something like an Emrakul die to a winged co quattle, you will be a believer. You can absolutely trust me. <laughs> and last but not least, the Zamek Guildmage. He has two abilities, both cost a green and a blue. The first one is, this turn each creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional 1-1 counter on it. I think that counts on the Simic Sky Squalor because it's each, right? 
And then the second ability is green blue, remove a 1-1 counter from a creature you control, draw a card. Hmm. So yeah, draw cards is always good. And now we go up to the instances, Beast Within, obviously, it's green, it has to be in it, it's a good removal spell. Um, here we have the Biomass Mutation. Creatures you control become XX until end of turn. So this can be very fun. If you have a lot of small creatures and everybody's like, yeah, he's not gonna do anything. Yeah, just put 10 mana into this and fuck everybody up. <laughs> uh, here we have Cross and Grip. I think this is one of the quintessential green cards because Cross and Grip, because it has split second, it is able to interrupt a lot of um, stupid infinite combos which involve artifacts or enchantments. So um, I, uh, I would really urge every green player play this because you will get um, silly infinite combos and just in general silly combos you will get them out of the game and you will laugh at your opponent while doing it. Mystical Genesis. Uh, it's a counter spell. Doesn't look like a counter spell, but it actually is. You counter a spell and then create an XX green ooze creature token where X is that spell's converted mana cost. And since we're on a counter, let's get another counter spell right out of the way. This time it's Plasm Capture. Uh, you counter target spell, and at the beginning of your next pre combat main phase, you add X mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool where X is the spell's converted mana cost. So, uh, yeah, you can do some interesting stuff with this one. Um, if you use it early game, you can get quite a tempo advantage. If, let's say, turn four, you have four mana, and your opponent plays something for four mana, maybe for five even, counter it, and next turn you'll have nine, ten, maybe more mana. So, this can give you a ridiculous advantage and sets an opponent back. Simic Charm. Uh, it has three modes. Uh, first one is target creature gets plus three plus three. It's okay, can make the difference, but probably won't. Um, next mode is or permanence you control gain hexproof on Slender Fern. That's a more interesting thing. And the last one is return target creature to its owner's hand. That can also be uh, come useful at times, but actually I'm more interested in the hexproof because it can disrupt a lot of uh, nasty things your opponents want to do. Next up is the snake form, uh, one of my favorite um, like instances to screw with people. You turn something into a 1-1 one, one green snake, basically, without abilities. So you can, even the biggest creatures can be killed like that, it's amazing. And you also draw a card, at top of it. Last instant is Steady Progress. First you proliferate, and proliferate, of course, is you choose any number of permanents and or players with counters on them, and they can give each another counter of that kind he already has. So, it's basically putting one more counter on everything you want, if it already has one. And then you draw a card, because why not? Next up we have the Sorceries, Explosive Vegetation for some land um, drawing. Genesis Wave, as we already mentioned. You of course reveal the top X cards and then put any number of permanent cards with converted mana cost X or less among them onto the battlefield. Rest goes into your grave. Give and take. Uh, the first part, so you can play them separately or fuse them together. Of course, if you fuse them, you have to pay both parts, but in EDH that's not that much of a problem. The first part is give, put three 1-1 one, one counters on target creature. This can actually make quite of a difference, and it can be comboed quite funnily uh, in some ways. And take is remove all 1-1 one, one counters from target creature and draw cards equal to the number of 1-1 one, one counters removed. So you can just do that on a Fathom Mage for 6 mana. You put 3 one, 1 counters on it, you draw 3 cards and then remove all of them. If it doesn't didn't have any counters on it, in a worst case scenario, you again draw 3 cards. So 6 cards for 6 mana. That's actually quite good. <laughs> Here we have Primal Command. I'm just a fan of commands in general and the Primal Command is nice. It's, it's of course no Cryptic Command, but hey. You cannot have a cryptic command in every deck, sadly. I only have uh, two, and one is in my command deck, and the other is my in my blue 
Delver deck, basically. So Primal Command, it has four modes, you choose two. Uh, one mode is you gain seven life, then another mode is to put target non-creature permanent on top of its owner's library. Next is target player shuffles his or her graveyard into his or her library. And the last mode is you sh search your library for a creature card, reveal it, put it in your hand, shuffle your library. So it, I just like the versatility of it, basically. Rampant Growth for more uh, mana gain. Spitting Image is a very interesting card. Basically, you uh, play it, it costs 6, which is kind of uh, expensive, and you create a token that's a copy of target creature. The upside of this card is it has Retrace, uh, meaning you can cast it from your graveyard if you're discarding a land in addition to its normal cost. So late game, if you're getting mana uh, land flooded, you basically can just cast Spitting Image over and over again, which can change the board state quite heavily. Unexpected Results is in here because I like gambling, basically. <laughs> uh, you shuffle your library, then reveal the top card. If it's a non-land card, cast it without paying its mana cost. Important here, you cast it, you effectively cast it. And if it's not a non-land card, you just uh, get a land and put it onto the battlefield. So, and if it's a land, of course, you also return ex unexpected results to its owner's hand. So you're always getting a permanent out of it. Sometimes you'll get a land and get uh, unexpected results back, which is cool. Sometimes you'll get like a little creature, maybe, I don't know... Uh, a coiling oracle or something sometimes you will uh, get something big sometimes you will get a hydra or something like that so this is kind of cool uh, it's a bit gambly but i like it uh, here we have urban evolution you draw three cards and you may play an additional land this turn so i just like it because of card draw and if i can play an additional land every once in a while that helps out as well now we get to the artifacts this one, uh, I just basically discovered this recently because I wasn't really looking at Kaladesh cards before I made this EDH, this commander deck. It's the animation module. Whenever one or more 1-1 one -one counters are placed on permanence you control, you may play you may pay one if you do create a 1-1 one -one colorless servo artifact creature token. So if you put counters on things, you even get um, uh, tokens for it now, which is kind of cool, because if, of course if you distribute tokens you want to make your things big, but then if your creatures get killed you lose all of it. But with this you can not only go tall, you can also go wide, which is awesome. Of course it also has a second ability which is pay 3, tap, choose a counter on a target permanent or player, give that permanent or player another counter of that kind. So it's just like a small proliferate kind of thing. The Chimeric Mass, it enters with X charge counters and for one mana you can turn it into a creature with base power and toughness X, which, uh, well, which is X is the amount of charge counters on it, obviously. The Contagion Engine, I really like this one. When it, it enters the battlefield, you put a minus one, minus one counter on each creature target player controls. So it's just against one player basically, but the other effect is actually much better for your deck. It's 4 tap, proliferate, then proliferate again. So with this you can get an incredible amount of counters and by extension an incredible, incredible amount of card draw as well. The Elixir of Immortality, it's just in most of my decks because I like it, because it basically means I can never run out of good cards. I just get them back into my library again and start anew. So it uh, basically protects me from mill decks. Unless it gets milled itself, of course. The expedition map will get me some more lands. Moss Diamond gives me more mana. Simic Clue Stone, Simic Signet for more mana fixing. And the Thought Vessel, mana and no maximum hand size. Now we come to the enchantments. And first up we have... Oh boy. Asceticism? Is that how you say it? I think that's how you say it. Asceticism? Uh, creatures you control can be target of spells and abilities your opponents control. Yeah, easy, simple, nice. Bread for the hunt. 
is a card that uh, enables a lot of your 1-1 creatures uh, with counters to be a lot better. Because now, whenever a creature you control with a 1-1 counter deals damage, well, uh, combat damage anyway, to a player, you may draw a card. So again, more card draw. Followed Footsteps is one awesome enchantment. It uh, You enchant a creature of yours. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of Enchanted Creature. Another way to get four of your Biovisionaries and uh, win the game. This and Progenitor Mimic, Mimic can actually win the game in like two turns. It's quite amazing. <laughs> of course you can um, just uh, a food for thought here. Well, actually, it doesn't really work. I just wanted to say you can proge progenitor mimic and then follow footsteps on your progenitor mimic. But of course, because the, the tokens that the followed footsteps creates, they are tokens, even though they come from different sources, but they're still tokens, so progenitor mimic uh, will not activate on, on these tokens, sadly. It's still a kind of cool concept to get like a lot of mimics, which then in turn become other creatures. It's actually kind of a nice idea. <laughs> Forced Adaptation is a very cheap enchantment. It just costs a green mana. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a 1-1 counter on enchanted creature. You know, sometimes small cards like these can fester on, on, a, on a table if they're left unchecked and create something truly scarifying. And even if you just put it on a Fathom, uh, Fathom Mage, you get a card each turn because of that, if nobody deals with it. And you just paid one mana for it, so okay, that's nice, thank you. Inexorable Tide, whenever you cast a spell, proliferate. So this can get out of hand quite quickly in this deck, of course. And the Crisis Incubation, which is <laughs> pacifism, but weird. Well, um, it is an enchant creature and the enchanted creature can't attack block or activate its activated abilities. Of course, triggered abilities still activate, but that's something else. And then for one green and blue, you can return it to its owner's hand and put two 1-1 one -one counters on enchanted creature. So there's two ways you can use this. Put it onto your own creatures to return it and gain benefits. Put it on an opponent's creature to keep it down. And in an emergency, you can even get it back to hand, enforce a, a stupid creature and put it onto another. That's more troublesome. So, it's, uh, you know, flexibility with this card, which I like. I really value this in my cards, if they're flexible and can do multiple things at once. And before we go to the few lands that are important, let's look at the one planeswalker in here. It's, of course, Kiora, Master of Depths. Uh, she has following abilities. For plus one, she can untap up to one target creature and or... and up to one target land. So, of course, it says up to, because if you have no uh, creatures uh, and or no lands, it would mean that you couldn't uh, get her plus one, which would be quite stupid, so it's up to, so you don't have to untap stuff, but you can. Her minus two is you remove the top four cards of your library. Uh, no, you don't remove them, of course, you reveal them. You may put a creature card from them and or a land card from among them into your hand. The rest goes into your graveyard. So at worst, four cards into the grave, at best, two in your hand, two in the grave. Minus eight is kind of interesting, should you ever get there. Uh, you get an emblem, which says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it fights target creatures you control. Well, is there more? Yes, of course! You immediately get three 8-8 eight, eight octopus creature tokens. Release the Kraken, motherfucker! <laughs> Alright, last we have the lands. Uh, there's just a few worth talking about. First off is the Alchemist's Refuge. Which is kind of an interesting land. It produces colorless mana, but importantly, you can pay green and blue and tap it, and then you can cast non land cards this turn as though they had flash. This changes a lot of things. You can get some interesting uh, combinations of spells going like that, things that normally wouldn't be instant. You can cast them, creatures in opponents' turns. You can do quite the nasty stuff. 
Um, something else that's in here is the Blighted Woodland. It's a land that creates colorless mana and you can sacrifice it, sacrifice it to get two basic lands and um, put them onto the battlefield tapped. So I like it because it not only gets me two basic lands of two colors potentially, it also thins out my deck and prevents me from being mana flooded. So I really like it. Um, other than that, there's just uh, Llanowar Reborn, which is a Graft 1 land. And the rest is very standard. Um, well, there's the Opal Palace. Um, well, the Opal Palace, I just put it in here for fun. Uh, it adds colorless mana and then for one and a tap, you can add to your mana pool one mana of any color in your commander's color identity. If you spend this mana to cast your commander, it enters the battlefield with a number of additional 1-1 counters on it, equal to the number of times it has been cast from the command zone this game. So, if your commander gets killed over and over again, you can get Opal Plelas and get him back with a huge 1 plus 1 plus 1 counter armor, basically. So he might not get killed again. Uh, I just kind of like it because it fits into the theme of the deck. Overall, um, you have, uh, as you have seen this deck, it features a lot of card draw, some big nasties, a lot of clones and copy uh, effects, and uh, generally speaking, it actually requires a lot of board wipes in my opinion. This deck has, in the few times I played it, it has drawn out so many board wipes. You know, it's just, oh, a progenitor mimic. Yeah, you need to board wipe, otherwise you get swarmed. Or something like uh, followed footsteps and a turn passes. Yeah, board wipe time, because it just gets out of hand. Stuff like that, or just a few of the big hydras out of the table. A, um, a, like a Genesis wave. Yeah, board wipe. It's just, in my opinion, it, this deck has caused a lot of board wipes and I'm absolutely happy with it. Um, it does it have weaknesses? Yes, of course, it relies on creatures, which um, I'm actually not even able to protect that well. So it's actually good that you board wipe. It's very good that the creatures get rid of. You just have to do it very regularly and sometimes even counter stuff uh, that this deck plays, because if if it sticks, if uh, I had uh, some interesting situations, especially with Progenitor Mimic and uh, Followed Footsteps and uh, Phantom, uh, Phantom Mage and Biovisionary and stuff like that, it's just, it's getting out of hand quickly if you let it do its thing. Because it's, it's just the color combination. Green will just put out massive creatures you have to handle, and blue will just play behind the scenes and set up some nasty plot that you walk right into. And of course, because it's green-blue, it gets a lot of card draw, it gets a lot of creatures, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, in my opinion, one of the hardest decks to deal with that I have. Um, what I have seen is there is a lot of X costed cards, so if I'm um, lost for mana, um, these cards will be very underpowered. So I actually would uh, suggest using a lot of land destruction against a deck like this. So keep the uh, big stuff uh, small. Don't let them have a huge mana pool, because if if a player like uh, with a deck like this has a lot of mana, he'll just basically outmass you and it will overrun you and just copy stuff, get stuff off of you, counter your stuff. It's just very nasty. You have to control it early on. Anyway, that's my opinion on this deck. I hope you like it. Let me know in the comments if you did or didn't for some reason. All right, that has been it for today. Uh, next time we're gonna look at the last commander deck that I have for now. I'm building some new ones actually. But the last one will be red and black. Some nasty color combination there. But until then, uh, I hope you had fun and I'll see you next time.